Thank you for joining me. Our goal now is to find the Taylor series for f of x equals x to the negative 1, where it's centered at x equals 0. And so what we're going to go do is we're going to have to go through piece by piece and figure out what this is going to be. Before we get started, I want to recall what a Taylor series is going to be. And while we derive this in class, it'll be nice just to know that the Taylor series for f of x is the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of the kth derivative at my center point, I'm going to call x naught, divided by k factorial times x minus x naught to the k. So now as I said, what we need to find is piece by piece, what is this going to look like? And then what is this whole thing going to look like? And we'll combine it together to figure out what our Taylor series will be. In order to help myself out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a table. And so for different k's, I'm going to find the kth derivative in some function of x. And I'm going to find the kth derivative at the center point, which is in this case 1. And so I'm going to try to write these out so that I can find a nice pattern. And so I'm just going to say let k be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then hopefully after that we can find a generalist case for the kth case. And then I'm going to say, okay, well... If we're taking the 0 at the derivative, that's the original function, so that was my x to the negative 1. If I plug 1 into that, 1 to the negative 1 is 1. And so then I'm going to continue filling out the rest of this table. So to do that, I'm just going to take the derivative of x to the negative 1 is negative x to the negative 2. Here again, we're going to plug in 1, so we get negative 1 to the negative 2. 1 to negative 2 is 1, so I just get negative 1. If I take the derivative of the first derivative, I get the second derivative. So the derivative of this is going to be negative negative is positive 2x to the negative 3. Again, I'm going to plug in 1, so I get 2 times 1 to the negative 3 is just 2. And now to get the third derivative, I'll take the derivative of the second derivative. So I'm going to get negative 3 times 2 times x to the negative 4, which is just negative 3 times 2 times 1. And now the reason why I'm writing it like that instead of just saying negative 6x to the negative 4, which is negative 6, is because my goal is to find a pattern. So if I leave it in pieces, it's easier to see what's happening each time than if I just write down the ending answer. I'm going to go one more and I'm going to say, okay, well, the next derivative is 4 times 3 times 2 times x to the negative 5. And so then I'm going to get 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And so now hopefully I can see what the pattern is going to be. And so if I want to say what's the fifth derivative, well, it should be this time negative 5 times 4 times 3 times 2x to the negative 6. So this should be negative 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And so now what we want to do is we want to generalize that pattern. As we generalize that pattern, I'm going to look at the different pieces of each of these. And so I'm going to notice that there is a negative that is coming in and out of these terms. So it's not always there, it's there every other time. And so I'm going to alternate from positive to negative to positive to negative. So when I'm finding my kth derivative, I'm going to say, well, what I'm going to have is something of the form negative 1 to the k. Now, I don't know if this is going to be k or k plus 1 or something else like that, but we know that negative 1 to the k alternates from negative 1 to 1 to negative 1 to 1 to negative 1 to 1. So to say that I'm going to alternate between positive and negative, this is a nice term to start off with to say, that pattern is in there. Now once we know that that pattern is in there, what we want to do is we want to check to make sure that the negatives line up correctly. So I would say negative 1 to the 0 is 1. So I get a positive for the 0th term, which is exactly what we got here. If I plug in k equals 1, I get negative 1 to the 1 is negative 1, which does indeed line up here. Negative 1 squared is 1. So again, we're getting a positive, so that's line up. And so what we have is, okay, the negative 1 to the k lines up accordingly with what I have for the results of my derivatives. So I know I'm going to have the term negative 1 to the k in there. The next part of the derivative that we see is that 
we keep getting these two and three times two and four times three times two and so each time I'm multiplying by the next number because as I'm taking the derivative I'm multiplying by the new power so what I'm going to end up with is I'm going to get well two two times three two times three times four and so we'll notice that we're multiplying by something something minus one something minus two all the way down to one and so I'm going to have some form of k factorial here now I'm writing that in as a placeholder at the moment so I just want to say, okay, I'm going to have a k factorial, but I want to make sure that lines up because it might be k minus 1 or k plus 1, depending on what I'm getting here. But I know that I'm going to have to use a factorial. So again, I'm going to go through and say, well, 0 factorial is 1. We get 1. 1 factorial is 1. So ignoring the negative, we do get 1. 2 factorial is 2. 3 factorial is 3 times 2. So that's still line up. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So we do get that this does line up, and so what we're going to end up with is negative 1 to the decay, k factorial. Now, if we wanted to continue with our derivative, we would see that we have an x to the negative 1, x to the negative 2, and in general what we're going to get is x to the negative something, and in fact what we're going to get is negative k plus 1. But we don't necessarily need that in this case because what we're really looking for is the kth derivative at the point. And regardless of what this ends up being, is it's some power of x. But every power of 1 is just 1. So what we end up with is, well, if I plug 1 into the equation, I get negative 1 to the k times k factorial. So my k derivative at the center point 1 is just going to be negative 1 to the k times k factorial. So now if we go back to finding our Taylor series for x to the negative 1, we recall, okay, by definition, it's the sum from 0 to infinity of the kth derivative at our center 1, or k factorial, times x minus 1 to the k. And so now we're going to plug in what the kth derivative is, because we just found that. We're going to get the sum from 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the k times k factorial, divided by k factorial, times x minus 1 to the k. Now in this case, we're able to cancel out the k factorials. So what I get is just the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the k times x minus 1 to the k. Or if you prefer, you could write this as the sum from 0 to infinity of 1 minus x to the k. Because this would be negative 1 times x minus 1, the whole thing to the k. Negative 1 times x minus 1 is just... 1 minus x, and so it simplifies a little nicer so that we can deal with it as we ask more questions about this. Now that we've found our Taylor series, our next goal will be to find the interval and the radius of convergence for this Taylor series. That is, what x values does this make sense for? And we notice with series that sometimes these will converge, sometimes they will diverge, and so what we're claiming is that this function is going to be equal to this as long as this converges. But if it diverges, then we don't get the same thing. So we do need to find that. So where does this converge? Well, what we're going to do is the same thing we had been doing with the other series is we're going to go through our decision tree and try to find a test to determine when this converges and when it doesn't converge, or that is, it diverges. So what we get is that if this term and absolute value is less than 1, then we're going to get that the limit as k goes towards infinity of 1 minus x to the k is in fact going to be, well, something less than 1 to the k. As k get large, these terms get smaller and smaller. So this will go to 0. So we do in fact get that this limit is equal to 0 when this is less than 1. Now, if this is exactly equal to 1, you get 1 to the k, the limit is 1. But otherwise we get if 1 minus x and absolute value is greater than or equal to 1, then the limit as k goes towards infinity of 1 minus x to the k is, well, in that special case, we got 1. So if that's an x equals 0, then we're going to get that it's undefined otherwise. So in either case, what we get is that this limit is not 0 because it's either 1 or undefined. So in both of these cases, what we get is that the limit as k goes towards infinity of 1 minus x to the k 
is not going to be zero. So therefore, if this is true by the divergence test, we'll know that this series diverges. So we already know that this is going to diverge whenever the absolute value of 1 minus x is greater than or equal to 1. So now as we're going to go forward, we're going to assume that that's not true, and we're going to assume that the absolute value of 1 minus x is less than 1, because we need to determine in that case, is it going to converge or diverge? The next question in the decision tree is, are the terms alternating? And well, if we pick the correct x's, we can't actually make the terms alternating. So if we pick 3 halves, 1 minus 3 halves is negative 1 half to the k, does have a negative 1 to the k in it, so it would be an alternating series. Whereas if we pick, say, 1 half, then 1 minus 1 half is 1 half to the k, and it would not be alternating. When we do have an alternating series, we're going to end up with, well, these terms are going to 0, so we're going to get a convergent series. However, since it may or may not be alternating in this case, I'm going to stick with, well, we'll say it's not alternating. We'll try to use some other test, which can hopefully cover the bases where it is alternating or not, to determine whether this series converges or not. The next question we have in the decision tree is that, does the series look geometric? And indeed, it does look geometric, because it looks like that we're in getting our new term by multiplying by something new each time. So if I want my next term, I would multiply by 1 minus x again. And so it, it does look geometric. The next question in our decision tree is, can you write the terms in the form a times r to the k? And actually, we have already written it in that form as part of the simplification. Is a here would be 1, but then r is 1 minus x to the k. So yes, the terms can be written exactly in the form a times r to the k. Next question would be, is the absolute value of r less than 1? Well, what we decided was that r was actually the 1 minus x, and so we would claim that 1 minus x an absolute value. Now recall that if this was greater than or equal to 1, we already said that the series diverged. So now we're working through the case where this is strictly less than 1. So we know that this is less than 1, but we also know that the 1 minus x is our r, so we're going to claim that r, an absolute value, is the absolute value of 1 minus x, which is strictly less than 1 because that's the case we're working with. Because that's true, what we get is that then the series converges by the geometric series test. And so we know that this series will converge as long as the absolute value of 1 minus x is strictly less than 1. We've already shown that this series diverges if the absolute value of 1 minus x is greater than or equal to 1. So what we know is that this series will converge if and only if the absolute value of 1 minus x is less than 1. All right, so now we need to find our interval and radius of convergence. And what we decided was that this series converges if and only if the absolute value of 1 minus x is less than 1. So what we have is that this is going to converge on for x's that satisfy this property. Now because we have this in the form something minus x is less than 1, we've already actually found our radius of convergence is just going to be 1. So we would say the radius of convergence is 1. Now to find the interval of convergence, we need to find the x's that satisfy this. And so if I wanted to write that in your normal interval form, what I could say is this means that negative 1 is less than 1 minus x is less than 1. And so I would subtract 1 and I would get negative 2 is less than negative x is less than 0. I can divide by negative 1. Remember, if I divide by a negative for inequalities, we have to switch in direction. So we get 2 is greater than x is greater than 0. So my interval of convergence is x between 0 and 2. And so my interval of convergence is just 0 to 2. Now, normally we would have to check the endpoints to determine, well, what's going on there. But we've already actually checked the endpoints because we said that at the endpoint 0 and at the endpoint 2, 1 minus x was exactly equal to 1 in absolute value. But we decided there that our series would diverge by the divergence test. Hence, we get that the interval convergence is precisely 0 to 2, and we won't include the endpoints. All right, now that we've found our Taylor series and we found the interval of convergence, what we're going to do is we're going to use our Taylor polynomial of degree 2 to approximate 1 divided by 1.1 by using the Taylor polynomial to 1 over x centered at 1 
at degree 2. Now what this means is that we know that if we stay within our interval of convergence, which we said was 0 to 2, we can take infinitely many sums and we'll get the exact answer for 1 over x. But if instead of using infinitely many terms, we use some finite n, we'll get an approximation. Therefore, in this case, we're letting n be 2 so that we can get an approximation for 1 over 1.1 so that we can find that as an answer. Now, what we're going to do to say this is we're going to say that, okay, well, 1 over 1.1 1 .1 is approximately equal to the Taylor series of degree 2. So that would be the sum from 0 to 2 of the kth derivative at 1 over k factorial times x minus 1 to the k. And so what we did is we have already found the Taylor series, so we can use that form for the Taylor polynomial. So we're going to get the sum from 0 to 2 of, and then this was just 1 minus x to the k. Now, all we need to do is plug in k equals 0, k equals 1, and add these terms together. So if I plug these in for x equals 1.1, I'm going to get that 1 over 1.1 is approximately equal to, well, if I plug in 0, I get 1 minus 1.1 to the 0 plus 1 minus 1.1 to the first power plus 1 minus 1.1 squared. So if I write this out, I get 1 minus 1.1 to the 0 is just, well, 0.1 to the 0 is 1, plus 1 minus 1.1 is negative 0.1, and 1 minus 0.1 is negative 0.1, but negative 0.1 squared is plus 0 0.01. And so what we get is 1 minus 0 0.1 is 0.9, plus 0 0.01 is 0.91. Therefore, our Taylor polynomial approximation of 1 divided by 1.1 is approximately 0.91. Thank you for joining me today as we worked through the proof of this theorem. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something along the way. If you did, make sure to click that like button and to subscribe to the channel. There's more resources available in the description below, and also check out our other videos.